Okay, so we have Dylan Wilson, who's going to talk about Redshift, Lichtenbaum, Quillen, and multiplication on BP brackets N. Thanks a lot, JD, and thanks, Dan, too, for the invitation to speak. Um, yeah, I'm going to wait just a second to share my screen to do something a little selfish, which is I totally no judgment if you're not in an environment or headspace where you want to do this. But if you are, I would love to just see as many of your faces as I can before I stare into a uh, talk into a black hole for 45 minutes. It's so good to see new faces and old. Thank you so much for being here. I mean, this is like so great to see all of you. I know. That yeah. Let me add also to what Dylan's saying. It is gratifying to see this. You know, we are a community, right? And and here we are, even though we're not in physical space together, but we are nevertheless no less of a community. And um, and it's great to see all of you. Thanks, and thanks so much for coming. Yeah, thank you. And I'm I'm super grateful that Dan just had this space ready to go uh, when things things took a turn, and uh, and here we are. So um, thanks for being here. I know it means a lot. We're all tired of staring at screens. So it's extra, uh, it's, I have some extra gratitude that you're willing to do it for a little bit while I speak at you. And um, all right, I'll, I'll share my screen now. I won't, uh, but it's nice to see all of you. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna be talking about um, some work that's joint with Jeremy Hahn about um, redshift uh, Lichtenbaum-Quillen, although I don't know what's, someone can correct me if I'm allowed to call it Lichtenbaum-Quillen or if I'm only allowed to call it Quillen or if I should call it Lichtenbaum or if I should say it in the other order. Um, and then, uh, and a bit about multiplication on BPN. So what's the deal? Um, so there's this philosophy that, uh, that Bert foreshadowed, which is um, this redshift philosophy of Osonian and Ragnus, which is that if you do algebraic K theory, it does something to the height of whatever you put in, it should increase it by one. Um, and there's a couple of different ways that you might think about what that means, like what it means, what is the height of a thing, of a ring, and what would it mean for it to go up by one? Uh, so there's a couple of choices you have. I've listed two possibilities here. So one thing you might ask is that you start with a ring whose KN localization is not zero, and you get out something whose KN plus one localization is not zero. There's other variants of that. Um, and another formulation, um, which is, slightly more precise is that if R is what's called FP type N, then K of R is FP type N plus one. So let me say what that means. That's one way of capturing a notion of what you might mean by the height of a ring or chromatic complexity of a ring or something. So this is definition is due to Mahold and Resk. So we say that X is FP, which sort of stands for finally presented, although Nowadays, that might be confusing. Like there's lots of things that could mean. So I'm just going to say FP. So F, X is FP if it's P complete bounded below. Um, and then this strange condition. So if there's a, a finite complex so that um, the homotopy groups, there's finitely many and they're all finite after smashing with that complex or tensoring with that complex. So I don't know, this is some, sort of finiteness condition on X, it's equivalent to asking that it's cohomology be finitely presented over the Steenrod algebra. And uh, Bert talk, told us a lot about finite complexes and how they, they exist in these, uh, in these families where you can ask if a finite, what type a finite complex has. And we, we say a spectrum has FP type X. Um, we say it has FP type, sorry, the FP type of a spectrum X is N minus one um, where n is the minimal uh, number such that there's a type n complex that makes that condition hold, okay? So you, you know, there's some finite complex that makes this work. In fact, the collection of finite complexes that make this work forms a thick subcategory, 
So you can just ask which of the thick subcategories is it? And then, oh no, it's plus or minus one on that. I would have to think for a second. <laughs> um, so for example, the FP type of BPN, the truncated Brown-Peterson spectrum is N. Um, the FP type of KO is one. Uh, the FP type of TMF is two. So you see that it captures somewhat this notion of things living at height, at the height you expect them to be. Okay, so let me give a brief overview of the work that already exists and it's gonna be an incomplete overview, but it's the best I could come up with on short notice. I'm new to some of this literature. So if folks wanna call out their, their favorite friends to add to the list, I'm really happy to do so and happy to learn about them. But here's some of the history and previous work on, the, on this sort of redshift sort of thing. So um, back in a while back, there's heights negative one and zero. So this is names associated to this work would be like these, Quillen and Susan and Listenbaum, Thomason, Hesselhold, Bachstedt, Madsen, Ragnus, Wibadsky and Rost, and I'm sure more. And the flate, there's lots of results in, in here, but just to give you some of them, um, Quillen computed that the K theory of, of FP after P completion is, is the p-adic integers. And Suslin show that the K theory of, I mean, lots of things, but in particular, if you take the algebraic closure of Q and P complete, then you get um, connective complex K theory. Um, there's this result, which is some variant of Lichtenbaum, Quillen, Quillen, Lichtenbaum, Lichtenbaum, Quillen. I'll figure it out one day, um, which, <laughs> which is that, um, this map uh, from the K theory of, of nice enough, I think finite dimensional rings is what you need. Um, the P complete K theory of that looks the same as this localized variant um, in high enough degrees. Someone gonna, I'm really excited if someone in the chat is about to tell me which of these things it's true. Oh no, that's a question which I didn't answer, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, please feel free to ask questions. I'm, it's a little hard for me to see the chat, but then if someone wants to tell me that there's something in the chat, I can go see that there is. Okay. Um, actually, wait, I can see the chat if I keep it there. Sorry, clearly I'm an amateur. All right, so that's the story for heights minus one and zero. Then there's been some beautiful recent developments to give upper bounds on how much can the height shift when you do K theory? Can it go up by seven? Um, and the answer is generally no. So um, one of the early results in this area was by Steve Mitchell and then lots of results since then by Osoni, Ragnus, Angelina Noel, Salch, uh, recent stuff by Klaus and Land, Matthew Meyer, Nauman, Noel, Tom. Um, uh, and sort of the state of the art is a result like this, which is, um, from that last batch of authors, um, which is that if R is E1 and say uh, it's Tn and Tn plus one localizations vanish, then uh, K theory uh, doesn't bump up more than one. And if R is E infinity, you can just use this condition, thanks to a result by um, Jared. So that's, that's kind of the state of the art on how much can the height go up. And so what's, what work has been done on lower bounds? So this is, it's a little bit of a different flavor. It's much more computational. You're trying to show that something isn't zero. So, you so it's, it's a little bit of a different feel. So a lot of these are, you know, have to find some elements some here, somewhere and check that it's not zero. So there are these computations of Osonian and Ragnus and the K theory of things like K theory or BP1. Um, there's some, I think, work in progress by Bruno and Ragnus on the K theory of TMF, check, trying to check that it's um, FP type three. Um, uh, Gabe has some stuff on iterated K theory detecting the beta family. And then a, a slightly different flavor than those is, so this doesn't quite fit in the FP type world. So it's a little different, but there are these spectra YN um, and Angelina Noel and uh, Quigley show that the height uh, doesn't go down, which is a good, Good thing to know. I think uh, that would be that would be that would be very much not redshift. Um, so, and then there's definitely a lots more um, results in this area. Um, there's some the ambidexterity stuff um, from Carmeli Schlenk and Yanovsky. Um, Craig Westerlin has uh, in his, his higher chromatic 
variants of image of J, some results, Bruno Nielsen and, and Ragnes have done some stuff at, at infinity with MU, I know. Um, so before I move on, is there anything, are there any uh, omissions that I am apologizing for in advance that anyone wants to give a shout out to for some of this stuff? Uh, just one minor thing. So in the results of myself and JD, uh, probably the more interesting thing is maybe the result about TP. So TP um, does like K um, N plus one, uh, K N plus one uh, of TP of Y of N is, uh, is uh, zero. So that's, so anyways, there's a result for TP as well. Oh, sorry, let me get this right, of Y N. Thank you for that. Yes, um, yeah, and a lot of these, I'm about to say that in a second, that in our work too, a lot of these are gonna immediately drop for this lower bound world. For the upper bound stuff, it's, it's good to stay with K-theory, but for the lower bound world, we're gonna kind of immediately uh, use Dendish Goodwillie McCarthy and other sort of trace methods to quickly pass to TC or TC minus or TP or one of our favorite computable variants. So thanks for that. Any others? I just love that, like, how many people are involved in this story and how many of those people are here. It's very exciting. All right, so that's what all of our friends did. Um, and we wanted to add to this story. So our, um, our result is, well, the first result is that if you have an E3MU algebra form of BPN, so BPN unfortunately can come in many different fortunately or unfortunately has many different uh, forms. And if you have an E3MU algebra version, then the algebraic K theory of it has FP type N plus one. So we saw before that BPN has um, FP type N. And so this bumps it up by exactly one. I think this is the first example, a sort of arbitrary height of this bump up happening. Um, or it's not an example yet until we know that there are E3 MU algebra forms of BPN, and luckily there are. So the other thing we prove is that in fact these things exist. So that's good to know. Okay. So uh, okay. So I'm going to do a warm up in a second. But are there any questions about sort of if I used any unfamiliar words? So TC and and THH I'm going to define in a second. K theory we're not really going to see again. Uh, but if there's anything else that anyone has questions about, I'll, I'll pause for a minute. All right. Okay, so I want to give uh, to give some motivation for some of the techniques we're using or some of the way we go about proving this. Uh, I just wanted to. This might be re a review for for some people and. Um, maybe nice thing to hear about for other people, uh, which is to just think about sort of the story going from minus one to zero, which is the story of how we get from FP to ZP. And as I said a minute ago, uh, I'm going to drop K theory from now on and focus on cyclic homology, which I'll define sort of as I go along. So I'll start by defining THH and, and, and then you just have to trust me or trust, uh, I think Dundas is here, that, uh, that that's good enough. <laughs> and um, and uh, yeah, so, so let me start by telling you what this THH is. So if you have an E1 algebra pretty much anywhere in a symmetric monoidal category, then you can define this gadget, which for now I'll define as coming with an S1 action and later we'll give some more structure. So you can define this gadget by looking at this, what's called the cyclotomic bar construction. So you take all the tensor powers of A and there are the various multiplication maps going from one to the next. And then there's one that cyclically permutes and then multiplies. And this has an action by uh, sort of cyclic groups at each step, which realizes, if you take the geometric real realization, uh, you get this object which has an action of S1. It's a rough idea of what THH is. And if you just care about what this thing is not without the S1 action, then sometimes it's more computable to think about it this way which is to think of this as, as computing for you this relative tensor product by starting with a free bimodule resolution of A. So that's THH. And the really fundamental 
computation is this theorem of Bakshtet. It's where everything always gets started. Um, and there are by now lots and lots of different proofs of this computation that THH of FP is FP adjoint X where, uh, with a degree two class. I wanna review a specific computation because it sort of will feed into other computations. So uh, here's the idea. So the idea is to use this, this uh, non-equivariant formulation of what THH looks like. Um, and so you get the Kunath spectral sequence that starts from uh, Tor over the dual Steenrod algebra and converges to um, pi star of THH. And there aren't very many Tors we can compute in life, but this is one of them. So this is, uh, you know, the dual Steenrod algebra is a polynomial tensor exterior. And so the polynomial part will, well, the exterior part will contribute a divided power algebra, which makes us afraid. And it looks like this on the suspensions of all the tau i's. And the polynomial part will produce an exterior algebra, which makes us slightly less afraid. Okay. And if you revisit Bockstedt's computation, he did it a little differently, but it essentially amounts to establishing some differentials uh, relating these CI classes and um, uh, powers of these uh, or divided powers of these tau i classes. Uh, so, so first, so Bachstadt gives differentials that tell us that the EP page um, ends up being a truncated polynomial on all of the tau i classes. So that's almost the answer. Um, and um, a power operation gives the extension sigma tau i to the p is sigma tau i plus one. So this, this class x corresponds to sigma tau zero, or if you like, sigma squared. So let me say that x is comes from tau zero, or if you like, it even comes all the way back. Tau zero itself came from P. So I might think of this as coming from B zero. So I, I went through this calculation just because I want to emphasize that, um, that somehow this X, this periodicity operator knows about all of the tau i's, which in your head should make you think that it knows about all the VI's. So it's just sitting there waiting to become whatever VI you need it to become at any given moment. And that's kind of where the redshift is gonna happen is there's gonna be a power of X lying around and it's not in the right degree to be a VI, it's off by two, but it's just waiting to be put there so that it can become a VI. All right, so now let's keep going with this FP calculation. So we started with THH, but that's not good enough. We need a way to move that class X by a degree, by two degrees. So one way to do it is to use the circle action and that has the uh, nice feature of introducing, when we take fixed points, introducing this generator corresponding to the first churn class. So this, is, this, this would be the E2 term of a spectral sequence, or if you like the associated graded of TC minus for some filtration. It's gonna have that class we saw before, and then this new class coming from the circle action. So this will be in degree two, this is in degree minus two. And the point is, is that this class's job is essentially to remove that sigma squared and turn t times x into the number p. And that's actually pretty formal. Sort of whenever you can name a class as sigma squared something, um, then t times it uh, will be the something. So the circle action has the property of sort of undoing uh, this, this thing that was hiding the, the v, v near v0. So before we started in a place where P was equal to zero and suddenly in, in TC minus and TP, P is not equal to zero. In fact, in this associated graded, the class T times X is non-nilpotent. So every power of P is not zero. And notice that like once we knew that we had this ring structure and we knew that the, the class P was detected by this, all the other powers of P followed. 
it was important that we had this ring structure lying around because it was easy to name this element, but it might not have been easy to name other powers of p. Okay. Okay, so now that, 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 that gets us to Tc minus and Tp, and we've already seen this sort of redshift now, right? Because now we're gonna get that Tc minus of Fp is Zp adjoin Xt modulo of this relation, and Tp, um, well now X becomes redundant because we invert P or T. But not either way, uh, we've bumped up the height already. But let's keep going to TC and see what happens. These aren't FP spectra yet. Okay, so to define TC, I can't work in an arbitrary symmetric monoidal category anymore. I know, I know that maybe you weren't thinking that I was earlier, but, um, but secretly everything we've done before was fine. But now I need to have this Frobenius. Um, so this definition is, is Nikolaus Schulze. This is their construction of, of, um, of TC. And um, so they start by observing that every spectrum has this canonical um, Frobenius map into uh, its tensor power Tate fixed points. And you do that at every stage of the cyclotomic bar construction and you can extract um, a Frobenius map on THH. And then TC, or really it's P completion. If I didn't mention it, everything is P complete all the time. So if I forget, that's what's going on. So TC is then, is then uh, the, the equalizer of the fixed points of Frobenius, which, which is a map from TC minus to TP, uh, and the canonical map. I guess I should say that A is bounded below for this to be the right thing right now. Okay, so that's, that's the definition. And we've sort of computed some of these pieces and we kind of understand the canonical map. And so we can understand each of these maps separately and uh, through a little bit, and they have different flavors. So on the one hand, this map phi turns out to be an equivalence in non-negative degrees, which means that it's, that's still true once I take fixed points. So phi wants to be an equivalence. So this is a computation that you can do. Um, and on the other hand, the canonical map wants to be zero mod p in positive degrees. So this you can just work out from the, what we've already done. So you can see that x just, we, this map is, the canonical map just inverts t, I should have said. Phi does something more interesting. Phi actually sends x to t inverse. But this map just inverts t. And so that forces x to go to something that's divisible by p. And so every power of x goes to something divisible by p. And so the canonical map is zero mod p in, in positive degrees. Okay. So let's just put that together. Putting that together, we're interested in studying the fiber of this map. And we know that this map is an equivalence uh, in positive degrees. And this map is zero mod p. And so this difference is an equivalence in positive degrees, which tells us already what the connective cover of, of TC is going to be. And actually, I mean, it's, you can actually do the computation in this case. The rest of TC is not that bad. It's just one more copy of um, ZP. But, but you don't need to know that. Um, the important thing is that this connective piece is ZP. So I think, yeah, OK. So that's, that's my overview of the story from moving from FP to ZP. Are there any questions about that? I, I went a little quick, probably. It's coming from the Galois group of FP. I don't know. I guess where I see it, you're saying that if I took FP bar, then maybe I wouldn't see that. Um, that sounds right to me, but someone that question may be above my pay grade. If someone else wants to answer with more confidence, great, tell me that's, that's what I was looking for. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay, great. So I wanna extract some of the key features of that story. Um, the first key thing that happened was this detection of Vn plus one as being non-nilpotent somewhere. 
So we, we just had to find, we, we needed to be able to find it, you know, and name it uh, and, and find some approximation to wherever it lives, some associated graded or whatever, where it was clearly non-nilpotent. That was important. The other important thing was uh, a version of the Siegel conjecture. So um, there's a THH version of the Siegel conjecture that I, um, has been studied in various. So when R is the sphere, it is the, the Siegel conjecture. And uh, in other examples, it's um, due to, I think, Hesselholt or rings, uh, that like maybe smooth, someone's gonna have to put the right words. Uh, let's see, maybe like regular, uh, commutative rings or something like that. And, um, and I think Angelini Noll and Quigley have a version for XNs, is that right? And, um, and then I, there's a version for MU that's known by Luno Nielsen and, uh, and Ragnus. Am I missing any Siegel conjectures? Okay. Um, yeah, so this is a version of the Siegel conjectures. This, this is sort of a phenomenon that's been that's been observed, and then we compute it that it seems to keep happening in lots of examples. So I think it's an interesting thing to want to study. This other phenomenon has been observed, but I don't think has been sort of singled out as a feature to look for uh, as much, or at least I haven't seen it. But the other thing that happened is that this canonical map vanished mod p. So more generally, at higher heights, you might ask that in high degrees it vanishes mod, you know, some power of that favorite ideal you have that um, uh, involving P through VN plus one. So you want some kind of divisibility because this gets you, uh, what's nice about having these two things is that then you can compute TC from two completely different directions. So if you have some way of really getting a handle on phi, then you can use that to prove this. And then if you have some other way of getting a handle on the canonical map, you can use that to prove this. And then this vanishing result means that you don't have to think too hard about phi minus canonical because it's just phi is gonna dominate um, once you complete it this state ideal. And then of course, you'd like to compute that everything was finite as you went along if you want to be an FP spectrum at the end of the day. But, um, but that, that turns out to be not as bad. Any questions about these sort of key features? I've stated them sort of as a higher height analogs of something that you might look for. When I write this mod P question mark and so on, that means smash with a type uh, N plus one uh, if it goes to VN and N plus two if it goes to VN plus one. Questions? Okay, so I, I want to talk about how we prove a uh, variance of these for um, uh, for BPN. So I, I won't talk about how we build the multiplication stru multiplicative structure because that's a bit of a different story. Um, and the Siegel story should also end at the n plus one. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, yeah, no, this is, so this one is for VN, and then this one is to VN plus one. Right, so in the, in the example of FP, it was true unconditionally without modding out by anything that we had an equivalence um, here. And then, um, and then the vanishing happened only mod P. Okay, so here's the, the outline of the proof. So the key, the key first computation is sort of an analog of Bachstedt's periodicity theorem. Uh, it's a very similar proof. It's the same power operation that appears but it happens relative to MU. So the key thing is to know that THH of BPN relative to MU as an out with its algebra structure, remember that's gonna be key when we wanna check some non nilpotence potents of something, is this. So it's BPN star adjoin all of these divided powers of sigma squared on BN plus one. And then there's other stuff coming in from the fact that this is MU and not BP, but it's all in even degrees. So this is, this is somehow the key computation. This is actually also the key computation in producing the multiplicative structure on BPN that we want. So like along the way, when you try to build an E3 MU structure, you start to need iterated THHs of something. And this is the, this is the key um, one to figure out. And then once you're at polynomial, you know you're allowed to bump up to exterior and then X over exterior is polynomial. 
everyone know everyone's happy with uh, that. Okay, so and this computation is done in the same way as I outlined. It's just that when you do this computation, you're going to be using BPN tensor over BPN with MU, and you're not going to have the analogs of the um, of CI classes lying around to get rid of these divided powers, but you're still going to have that multiplicative extension. Okay. So that's step one. And then step two, we needed to find Vn plus one somewhere. Right? And remember it was sitting over here, we had sigma squared Vn plus one. And so we, it's, it wants to be Vn plus one, we know, we just need to move it to the right degree. So the trick was supposed to be to take the, the fixed points. So we take the fixed points and we get a, there's a spectral sequence that tries to compute that. This is all relative to MU. And we get this answer as rings, Right? The spectral sequence just collapses because everything's an even degree. And so in particular, there really is this class called T times sigma squared Vn plus one. It's just sitting there um, and it detects Vn plus one and it's clearly non-nilpotent in the associated graded, so it has to be non-nilpotent. So this was the key thing, which was to work relative to MU and to have enough algebra structure to, um, to play with so that you only needed to detect Vn plus one and not its powers. Sorry. All right. So the next step is the Siegel conjecture and the canonical vanishing. And these are each proved in a different way. So um, for the Siegel conjecture, what we do is we, we, we think about using the atom spectral sequence for BPN, and then just like trying to boot, do THH and do TC minus and do everything to the atom spectral sequence directly, which is not really something you can do, but if you're careful with, with towers, um, and if you take the decollage of the, of the atoms tower, um, then it's associated graded as, is the E2 term. So take the decollage of the Adams tower and you get a filtration on BPN with this associated graded. Um, and then if you're careful to do everything to towers uh, and to do, um, then, then you really can uh, run this part of the argument. So let me say that more carefully. So you first filter BPN so that it has this associated graded. Now, Angelini, Noel, Salch uh, construct a sort of May spectral sequence that wants to get compute THH. Um, but you can actually do better than that because you know that um, you know that that THH works well with filtered things. So there's a filtered variant on the Frobenius map, which messes with the filtrations, but it still exists. Um, and so this allows you to, you know, a priori, um, you'd be worried because I, I told, I mentioned that phi doesn't work out in just an arbitrary symmetric monoidal category. For example, there's no analog of phi for THH relative to MU, at least that's known. Um, so, so you'd be a little bit worried, but it turns out filtered is okay. Um, and so there is this map phi that's compatible with this spectral sequence. Um, and you can just compute both sides because the input is an FP algebra. And we just like understand FP algebras pretty well. So the inputs to the spectral sequence are this and this, and it's just already true right at the E2 page that you're in equivalence um, in, in high degrees. So that has to be true at the E infinity page. Sorry, I should say it's true. I didn't write the part where you mod out by P through um, by V naught through Vn, but you need to do that too. So there's this, there's this fuzz lying around um, you no longer get like an equivalence right away because there's this exterior algebra fuzz, which might be hit by X minus one and various powers of that. But after that, you run out of this finite dimensional piece, you're okay. We don't have Frobenius before filtering, but after. no, you have. So these THHs are not relative to MU anymore. So they always have Frobenius before or after filtering. It's just that the THH relative to MU, which was a computation that we had before, that, that we're not using that computation in this step. So, so we're gonna use it at the next step. So, so. Okay, great. Sorry, I'm also a bit confused about what the claim is here. So this is a map of spectral sequences computing that. So that's what you're claiming, right? 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So this is a map of spectral sequences and its equivalents. It's definitely not. Uh, this definitely doesn't collapse. In fact, this is an interesting way. I think it's open. So, so this gives another proof of the sequence conjecture for MU, for example, which was known by other means. Um, and one thing we don't know is like if you just look at the usual Tate um, spectral sequence, say for THH of MU Tate CP. I don't think we know the differential. Like we know what the an eventual answer has to be, but we don't know what the differentials are that get you there. Um, and this is one possible route to start to understand what those are because you can get a pretty good handle on what these differentials uh, sort of have to do. Um, it's a little, it would be a little hard to compare the different spectral sequences, but it might give hints as to what's going on. So that'd be interesting. Okay, so the last piece Remember, we, so we were dealt, dealt with phi, and now we need to deal with this canonical map. And we're going to do that from, um, from a, a different perspective. So uh, we need to know that the canonical map is 0. Uh, and of course, we'd also like this finiteness to be checked. And both of these are going to follow from just the existence of some interesting spectral sequences. So I, I'll call this the approximation theorem, which is that I can find spectral sequences which are compatible with this canonical map that converge to TC minus NTP mod their respective ideals, and that have these properties. First, they're finite in every homotopy dimension. So that's going to tell you the corresponding fact is true about uh, TC minus NTP. And then the other is that um, this source of the canonical map in this approximation is going to be concentrated in non-negative filtration. And the target will be eventually in negative filtration. So that, that's going to tell you that every element is going to be zero, and there's no associated graded issue because everything above it is also zero. So it's going to be actually zero. So it's going to tell you that everything eventually goes to zero. So is it, does it make sense how such a, I mean, I haven't told you anything about these spectral sequences, but does it make sense that if you had them, that you would be happy and you get this, this vanishing and finiteness? Okay, so here's how this goes. The idea is to start with descent along uh, this map to the relative case because we understand the relative case really well. And as I said before, it's helpful that we can break up dealing with phi and dealing with the canonical map because here I don't have to worry about the cyclotomic structure or having a phi. I just need to worry about the S1 action to make sense of TC minus TP and the map, the canonical map. And that really does exist here. And this map is certainly S1 equivariant and so on. And then what you do is you mix descent along this map with the standard fixed point spectral sequences that compute Tate and the homotopy fixed points. So it's a little, again, it's like you have to be careful to do things in the right order. But again, you sort of take the decalage of the descent tower and you apply Tate and homotopy fixed points directly to the tower. And this turns out to give you a spectral sequence that doesn't require you to understand how the co-module structure deals with the circle action, because it sort of right away gives you your favorite um, uh, E2 page, which would just be like a join T or a join T plus or minus one. So that's a fun trick. And then the starting computation uh, is to sort out what does this descent thing do before you start playing with fixed points and so on. And the very beginning of that computation is to see what happens when you actually mod out by P through v, uh, Vn, which you can do. You, you, you know, it, P through Vn don't always exist, but they do exist in PPN. So there's a perfectly good BPN module called FP, um, and you can, and this computes that. Uh, and it turns out that this, this computation is, is well known, I think, um, and collapses right away. And it's the starting, it's the input. So you, you take that computation, which is very nice, and then you start, um, you start from there. So the next step would be to go from this ideal P through Vn, which only exists when you have an MU module structure, a BPN module structure, to something that exists over the sphere. And that's just a box Stein spectral sequence away. So you start with this answer. You bump it up via the box Stein spectral sequence, keeping track of the size. And then you adjoin t or t plus or minus one to get these spectral sequences that converge to, to the targets we'd like, tc minus and tp. 
And then we still need to mod out by one more piece, otherwise it won't look very nice. And now we use the detection theorem, which says that our Vn plus one is actually detected by an element named T times sigma squared um, Vn plus one. And so whatever power will be detected by whatever power. And you mod out by that power and you get exactly the spectral sequences that I alluded to. So let me show you a picture of kind of, it won't be as cool as the pictures that many of the <laughs> computational folks can produce but this is the best I can do. This is a rough schematic of what each of these spectral sequences is gonna look like. So you'll have this THH of BPN mod some power. And um, the point is that uh, there will be some sort of exterior algebra stuff happening here and some power of X here, X is that Bakhtet X or sigma squared um, V zero and then some power will be sigma squared V, um, Vn plus one. you have some finite stuff and then you're just multiplying by x. Then you take Tc minus, so you have to adjoin this T and it lives in this filtration, in filtration one, goes off in this direction. And so you'll, you'll have a, a bunch of stuff now, you, you know, you'll have a huge spectral sequence, but all of the stuff in this region is gonna be divisible by both T and x. So when I eventually kill some power of t times some power of x, um, this is gonna go away. So here, if I kill vn plus one, then suddenly that isn't there anymore. And I'm looking at this nice bounded region. Even more importantly, if I, invert, if I then also invert t, which wanted to go, oops, which wanted to go um, in this direction, if I then invert t and I look at tp, I, I see that eventually I'm concentrated in negative degrees, which is what I wanted. So the, so the canonical map is coming in from here and it has nowhere to go but zero. So that's the story of that computation. I think there's lots of interesting things to think about, uh, extensions of this idea to other ring spectra. I think it would be neat to, you know, we sort of do enough of the computation. We don't really do much computing with any of these spectral sequence. We just keep them around to bound stuff so that we can eventually say something is finite. But I don't think uh, it would be interesting to know what computations could be done with these um, and if they're useful for anything else. Um, but that's all I wanted to say, I think. So are there, are there any questions? Uh, Maybe first we can all uh, thank Dylan for the great talk. I'll... Okay, and then we do have a few minutes for questions. So I guess one, one thing that comes to mind is um, can can you do this for other families of spectra that sort of go between heights zero and infinity, like Johnson Wilson theories or something like that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so some of the stuff, right? So one thing that's that's hard. So I think that that would be a natural next thing to try. One thing that's difficult. I mean, the most difficult thing is that it's no longer connective. So now a bunch of, a bunch of things are gonna be moved around. Um, another thing that happens is, you know, we have this detection result. And if you wanna check that something's non-zero and you have a map of rings, then you can go as far away from possible uh, from the starting ring and find a ring where it's non-zero. Um, and so BPN is pretty good because lots of ring, lots of things map to BPN. So our detection result gives a similar detection results for for lots of things, but it doesn't give one for, for E theory because that receives a map from BPN. So I don't, I don't actually know, it, you know, if it's how to show, uh, or it, or it's not immediately clear if if this sort of detection result, this this first redshift result is true for for Johnson Wilson theory. Let's see. Thanks. So does it mean that uh, if you look at connective EO? You can you can say something about connective EO, which yeah, I think anytime you've got a it's connective ring mapping to BPN. 
Yeah, I think that I think that should give you a piece of this puzzle. It should at least it might it probably won't give you this FP stuff, but it should at least give you that some you know can plus one localization is not zero. Okay. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to double check. So, so some of the stuff we talked about today is is that is that all in the paper uh, on archive, or is that not? No, that's a good question. So, uh, in theory, this, that's, yeah, that's in theory, yeah. in theory, in theory, it was supposed to be by today, and then life, you know, is busy. So, uh, I we we're hoping to update the paper soon to include the new um, this like Siegel conjecture stuff and the vanishing and the FP thing. So, right now, the thing that's in the paper is the construction of this multiplication and then this detection theorem, basically. Um, Great. but coming soon, stay tuned. Great. Thanks. Yeah, because I mean, we were also, yeah, sorry, not to, um, should wait till after the recording's over, but um, so yeah, we've also been thinking about this, this same spectral sequence that converges to THH to BP pointy bracket N. Um, Perfect. Well, then maybe, um, we, yeah, I would love to, I'd love to hear, learn more about it. We don't do much. We don't do. We don't do very much serious work with it, and I'm sure you have lots of really interesting, um, sort of con actual things to say about it instead of just like here it is. <laughs> well, no, I think this is really nice. I, I was, um, yeah, I was looking for this in the in the paper, and I'm like really happy you sorted out the the FP type, yeah, version of this conjecture. It's really great. Great, thank you. Maybe since it's a little past 1215, uh, I'll just end it here, but then we can keep the meeting open and ask Dylan more questions after the, the recording has ended. So thanks again, Dylan and Bert for the, the talks today.